Um, uh, you and I had discussed before that um, you have uh, a lot of thoughts on, uh, on the Chinese economy and where it might be heading. So why don't, we, why don't we start with that? Okay, so I think China is sort of at a pivot point where going forward, the economic performance and the structure of the economy will be quite different than what we've seen in the past few decades. Uh, obviously, we've had a number of major shocks. We had trade wars, we had the pandemic, um, and now we have a very fraught relationship between China and the West. And many of those things contributed to a substantial slowdown in growth. Last year, in 2022, the economy barely grew for two major reasons. One was the zero COVID policy, whereby at one point, 70 major Chinese cities were in lockdown, uh, which significantly suppressed both dem consumer demand and business output. Uh, and then there's the property problem. Uh, after 30 or more years of excessive debt-fueled investment in residential property, two years ago, the government decided this is enough and there needs to be uh, a rebalancing of the, the economy. So uh, they took steps to limit the ability of property developers to issue new debt and roll over existing debts and to a sharp drop in property activity. So those factors led to very slow growth last year. And then after protests in December, at the end of last year, the government lifted all the COVID restrictions. The Economist magazine had a cover story saying China is about to take off. That's going to lead to a big increase in the demand for oil, higher oil prices, higher inflation. It didn't happen. Uh, instead, the Chinese economy has kind of limped along this year uh, because of a number of headwinds. One, of course, is the property situation. Uh, in the first nine months of this year, property sector investment was down 9.1% from the previous year. Property activity accounts for about 30% of GDP. So that's significant, and that is not going to change anytime soon. Plus, property is 60% of household wealth. Property prices have fallen. So consumers, rather than spending more, are saving more to rebuild their wealth, and consumer spending is growing slowly. We have a government in China that uh, is discriminating in favor of the state sector over the private sector, sometimes harassing the private sector. So private sector investment is not growing. And then China faces external headwinds beyond its control. Uh, the weakened global economy has hurt exports. Trade tensions with the West uh, have reduced foreign direct investment and changed the design of supply chains and reduced exports as well. And then of course, China has very onerous demographics uh, with a declining working age population and actually a declining overall population so that right now China is the second most populous country in the world after India. So I think these things are not going to go away. Uh, and I, I expect that over the remainder of this decade, that economic growth will probably average under 4% per year, which for almost any other country would be considered reasonably good. But it's a sea change for China from where they've been. And it has global implications. It will affect uh, com countries that export to China. Uh, it will affect global commodity prices in a favorable way. Uh, but the real question to me is, what is China's regime going to do about it? Because for the past 30 or 40 years, the Communist Party of China has uh, created legitimacy in the eyes of the public, uh, not because of communist ideology, but by delivering the goods to the people. And that's not happening anymore. Uh, so will they reform uh, in order to boost economic growth, or will they double down on what has become a more authoritarian and isolationist and statist um, economic and political policy. And that, I think, is the big question. That's uh, pretty impressive for uh, off the top of your head. Oh, okay. I, I was going <laughs> to uh, raise uh, demographics, but you mentioned it. Uh, mm -hmm. But that is, for, for sure, a very serious problem that China is looking at, a rapidly aging population, uh, a declining fertility rate. Uh, so it's a little bit like uh, where Japan has been, fewer and fewer working age people to support more and more uh, uh, older people. Um, but one of the things also that um, is going on, and I wanted to get your, uh, your thoughts on this, is that um, uh, young people, and uh, including college graduates in China, um, seem to be getting more and more demoralized. The unemployment rate among young people 
the Chinese government said it was 21% a while ago, and then they stopped publishing the, uh, the rate altogether. Some economists say it's actually in the 40, 40 plus percent uh, range. Uh, and there's a phenomenon in China that I'm sure many of the audience are familiar with called lying flat. Uh, young people basically giving up and uh, just kind of lying wherever they lie, lying in bed or wherever. Um, but that is a, a huge problem. Uh, there's an interesting article, by the way, I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it's in uh, this week's New Yorker by a, a fellow named Evan Osnos, who was uh, based in China for about uh, seven or eight years, a few years back, and is a very astute observer of, uh, of China. And this article is called something like uh, China's Growing Malaise or something to that effect. Uh, and he talks about all of these phenomena, some of which we've just uh, mentioned, uh, others uh, as well. Uh, and puts it all together in one long comprehensive piece, which is really quite, uh, quite well done. It's kind of depressing, but it's, it's, uh, it's very well, uh, well written. So I, I commend that to, uh, to your attention. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, some people are saying uh, that uh, China today is looking like Japan uh, 20, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Yeah, well, there is a lot of talk about the Japanification right. uh, of China, if there's such a word. Uh, and there are some similarities. I mean, when Japan went through its um, uh, asset bubble in the early 90s, and then uh, after that, a long period of very low economic growth and very low inflation, uh, it had partly to do with demographics, similar to the demographics that China is facing. It had to do with having gone through a period of excessive investment in property, uh, which is something China has gone through. Um, and it followed a period when people were worried that Japan was taking over the world, that it was a competitive threat uh, to the United States and Europe. And that's also true of China. So there are a lot of uh, similarities there. Um, and, and it does make sense, though, that a country like China, having emerged from poverty and becoming a middle income country, would see slower economic growth. That's normal. Uh, and we economists often talk about a middle income trap, uh, whereby you reach a certain level and then it becomes hard to move up the value chain because what is required to grow is very different than in the early stages. Uh, and maybe China has faced a middle income trap. And by the way, Japan didn't. Japan became a very affluent country. Um, but in the early stages of growth, China grew in part because there was this huge migration of people from the rural to the urban areas. And when you take a farmer who's very low productivity and put them in a factory with a lot of machinery, instantly you have a huge increase in productivity. And so that drove a lot of the growth of China's economy on top of what for a long time were very favorable uh, demographics. Now the demographics are not favorable and the migration has petered out for the most part. In order to grow now, China has to um, innovate. Uh, it has to open to the world in terms of uh, op uh, access to information and technology. Um, and that requires um, a strong uh, private sector financial intermediation. It requires open sharing of information. Uh, it requires um, a very liberal education system. Those things aren't really happening. Now you have a regime that's discriminating in favor of the state sector uh, and state-run banks and, and pretty much directing the state-run banks where to invest money. The state is investing in critical technologies, but China is not where the frontier is in terms of innovation. That's still over here. Uh, so in order for China to accelerate its growth, it would need to do a number of things that it's not doing. It would need to allow more privatization of the economy, more freedom for the private sector, more openness to foreign investment and foreign trade, more openness to foreign ideas, and that's not happening. So I think those are among the reasons why uh, China will ex experience slow growth. And we're already seeing the absence of inflation, which is a reflection of very weak demand in the economy. Yeah. In terms of uh, access to technology, that's actually uh, 
something that I think uh, Dr. Sean wants to, uh, to get into when he, uh, when he gets here, but that's for sure uh, a big issue. The U.S. has, um, uh, a year ago, the U.S. announced very tight uh, restrictions on export of um, certain high technology semiconductor, advanced semiconductor equipment and so forth. And then just uh, last week, the U.S. announced a new uh, round of tightening of export controls to China. So this is, uh, I'm sure we'll get into this uh, later when our speaker gets here, but this is a big, uh, big issue. One of the things you touched on, uh, I thought was uh, particularly interesting to me, uh, and that is the need to boost uh, consumer spending in China. Um, when I was in the government uh, quite a while ago uh, now, we had um, high-level talks between the U.S. and China called the Strategic Economic Dialogue when uh, Hank Paulson was the, uh, the Treasury Secretary. He was the chair of it. Then it became the Strategic and Economic Dialogue when uh, Hillary Clinton came in. Um, but one of the big focuses of those uh, discussions was the U.S. side trying to push China to boost consumer spending, to, to focus less uh, or rely less on exports and on investment, boost uh, social welfare spending so that uh, families would, and households would feel more comfortable, and try to also increase imports to, uh, to, to uh, increase consumer spending. This is now 15 years ago that we had these, uh, these discussions. So. It didn't happen. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. And um, at one point, consumer spending bottomed at about 35% of GDP. Here in the U.S., it's about 70%. Western Europe, maybe 55%. So that, that's an abnormal economy right there. Uh, with, and so much investment that the return on that investment was relatively limited. So the, if you know, normally, the amount of investment that China engaged in would have led to a very high rate of economic growth, but economic growth continued to decelerate over the past 20 years, even as investment increased, which meant that the investment funds were not going into the most profitable enterprises, and meanwhile, consumers were left behind. So, you know, one of the things that would need to be done in order to boost economic growth would be to liberate consumers uh, through a, a better social safety net, uh, but also by ending the system of internal migration controls, uh, the HUCO system, whereby migrants from rural areas in, who live in big cities don't have access to all the public services that other people do. Uh, and that stifles consumer spending as well. Um, but changing that means uh, requiring that local governments provide more social services to people that they don't, and those governments are now laden with debt related to the property bubble. So it's a it's kind of a big mess. <laughs> and, and one last point that I think you also yeah. touched on, which is that um, during the, the uh, high growth years, uh, China's growth really was driven by the private sector. Um, there's a slogan, which I can't remember, but private companies uh, employ 50% of the people or did and, and create 60% of the profits and 70%, 80%. Basically, the, the private sector was really driving economic growth in China. Uh, but under um, uh, Xi Jinping and this current government, the, the emphasis has been much more on state-owned enterprises. And um, a lot of the top uh, entrepreneurs have, uh, one way or another, left the country or have been sort of reined in. Uh, and that's a big issue as well. Right, right, indeed. Um, and it's not getting better. I mean, the, the government now is giving lip service to the idea that they welcome foreign investment. They want to promote the private sector. They issued a 31-point program uh, to create a more level playing field for the private sector. But to me, that reminds me of how you know, the, the Constitution of the Soviet Union pro probably provided the best uh, freedom of, of human rights of any constitution of any country. It's a matter of whether you actually implement it. Yeah. And uh, this is not being implemented. And I think there have been an expectation that when this president came in, that because of what he had gone through and his father had gone through during the Cultural Revolution, that he would um, be interested in promoting the reform process. That was the, the conventional wisdom a decade ago. Uh, that has not turned out to be the case. And so he's turned out to be more ideologically communist and, and favoring more state control of the economy, more party involvement even in the private sector. Um, and 
that's a point of view, but it's not really, in my view, uh, a recipe for unleashing um, entrepreneurship or private sector innovation. Yeah, I, I've heard him called a Mao with money. <laughs> um, so I have um, a couple of other discussion topics which I had planned to get into after uh, uh, Sean's speech, uh, which we can do now. Um, but let's uh, first see if there are any questions uh, from the audience on what we've been talking about so far. Yeah. Um, so uh, I haven't followed this very closely, but obviously, um, we have several governments in the United States that are making stimulus uh, in economic, different forms of economic stimulus to try to buoy the economy from whatever situation that we've seen in 2020. I have noticed, though, that, um, you know, for all their attempts to buoy, you know, support the stock market or support the currency, it really hasn't been working. I mean, earlier today, the Bank of Japan, you know, now trying to, uh, it seems like they're getting a little more aggressive. Um, I haven't studied a lot of this issue, so I was wondering if you had any comments on why the economy is not being successful. I, you know, the stimulus, to the, to the extent it exists, has been relatively modest. Uh, there's been some monetary stimulus in terms of a little bit of easing of monetary policy, easing of credit restrictions, uh, especially in the property market. Uh, there's been some fiscal stimulus in terms of more expenditures on infrastructure investment. Uh, this is sort of similar to actually what Japan did uh, in the 1990s, uh, where they also spent a lot of money on infrastructure. Uh, but that's not really um, addressing the fundamental problems that are restraining economic growth in China. The problem is consumer spending and private sector investment. And that's where <clears throat> there needs to be um, stimulus or easing of restrictions. And that's not taking place. So it's not surprising to me that what they've done so far in terms of modest monetary and fiscal stimulus has not been terribly effective. Um, and, and part of the problem, I think, is that um, local governments are laden with debt that they're having trouble servicing. And the investments are usually undertaken through local governments. And I don't think Beijing wants to impose a higher level of debt on those local governments, and they don't want to impose much more debt on the central government because I think they believe that at some point they're going to have to bail out many of the local governments, uh, depending on what happens with the property market. So, um, so it's not surprising to me that growth hasn't really uh, rebounded. Let's go to this gentleman first, and then we'll come to you. Much of the topics, actually, uh, this this evening in the last meeting that we had at this location, focused on the economic restraints um, of a company as a, of a country that we constantly hear of uh, spending an inordinate amount of money on the GDP on military. Um, Japan was demilitarized. Uh, China is a country that currently has already surpassed our US Navy as far as ships. We're talking about what the, I guess you would call it the populace, would be doing in order to uh, find other economic opportunities. Not, I don't personally know or hear how much money China is actually spending on the military. Um, if anyone does have that information, it'd be very helpful. And the second part of it is also given that China is an extraordinarily proud 4,000 year old dynasty that has pretty much put out much of what they are actually doing. Book of Five Rings um, spells it out. And their basic economic process right now, um, when you're big, look, look small. When you're small, look big is basically from the heart of war from Sun Tzu. Um, are we not paying close enough attention to what is actually right in our face? And we're being told that we're pretty much approaching this from a Western perspective, looking at, uh, okay, the financial restraints um, due to their uh, decline in GDP, ultimately will not 
allow them to be as much of a, I guess, a, a threat as we believe? Or are we looking at it, or is it something that we're completely missing? Um, all right, well, uh, on, on, on the military. On the military, yeah. I mean, it, evidently there's been an acceleration in military spending, building bases in the South China Sea. Uh, I think perhaps the most notable thing is that although China acquired nuclear weapons in 1964, for several decades they maintained a relatively modest stockpile of about 100 warheads, which was seen, I think, as uh, deterrence. Uh, but in the last decade, they evidently have increased that to about 400 we uh, warheads, and the U.S. military thinks they're heading to over 1,000 by early in the next decade. Uh, so that's a change in strategy for China. And I think it's probably meant as a deterrent against U.S. intervention if they should try to take Taiwan. And, and of course, the U.S. policy on Taiwan has changed. It used to be one of strategic ambiguity, and President Biden is the first U.S. president to say, no, if, if China invades Taiwan, we will defend them militarily. So um, that's where things stand, and, and, and that, I think, explains some of the export restrictions on the part of the U.S. Uh, the U.S. and Japan and the Netherlands have restricted exports of technology that's used to fabricate the most advanced chips. Uh, and, and those are needed for testing nuclear weapons and for developing other types of sophisticated weaponry. And I think that's probably the principal reason why the US has uh, engaged in those restrictions. But of course, that's created a, a conflict. Now China is withholding exports of rare earth min minerals. Last week, they imposed new restrictions on exports of graphite. Uh, which is needed to produce electric car batteries. So uh, the shift in strategic policy on the part of China um, has unleashed part, at least, of the, uh, the conflict that we're now seeing. Those, those last points actually anticipated one of the things I wanted to get into later, but, they, but you made all the, uh, all the points. I don't have the, uh, the military spending numbers off the top of my head, but one thing I do know, China, you are correct that China has been spending uh, a, a fairly substantial portion of its GDP on military and has built this enormous navy and so forth. However, uh, U.S. spending on military, I think, is equal to the next nine countries combined. So it's always useful to keep that in mind uh, for, uh, for perspective. Um, so uh, our, uh, our speaker has arrived, uh, Dr. Sean Wei Jin. Dr. Sean, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Told, uh, they would prefer if you could stand on that mark so you can be in the camera. No. I have to stand over there. All right. So I thought I was going to talk about the impact of trade and technology wars on the Chinese economy. As you all know, the trade war started in 2018 by the Trump administration. Five years have passed, and the question is how effective the trade war has been. And the stated purpose of the trade war is, of course, to reduce trade deficit with China, that is, by the United States with China. And then it morphed into another objective, and that is to decouple from the Chinese economy, because the two economies had become too integrated. So I think this is a good time five years later, just to look at to what extent the trade war has achieved its objectives. And I'll show you some numbers, right? This is the trade volume between China and the United States. As you can see, the trade volume between the two countries reached an all-time high last year to a tune about 700 billion U.S. dollars. By the Chinese statistics, is $690 billion. By American statistics, customs, is $740 billion. By either, there's some very good reason why there's discrepancy between the two customs collecting data. But by either, the trade volume 
despite of trade war, has reached the all-time high. And look at the trade deficit. The blue bar indicates the trade deficit the United States has with China. And as you can see from just about 2018, it has continued to grow. And now it's also all-time high. So on that particular score, you may say that the trade war has not achieved its effect at all. In fact, it's the opposite. Trade volume is now at all-time high. Now, you can look at another statistic, that is Chinese imports, that is American imports of Chinese goods as a percentage of America's total imports. That has come down. It used to be about 20%. Last year, it came down to 15%. So by that particular measure, you may say that America depends less on Chinese imports than five years ago. But the truth is under the surface. And this is the Vietnam trade with the United States. So last year, Vietnam's exports to the United States went up 30%. But Vietnam's imports from China went up 33%. So what's the story? The story is, as you can see from this chart on the left, the yellow part is Vietnam's imports from China. And the blue curve is Vietnam's exports to the United States. As you also can see, since 2018, both went up very sharply for a very good reason, because the trade war started a jump in both numbers, but Chinese exports to, the, to Vietnam exceeds substantially Vietnam's exports to the United States. On the right-hand side, you see why that is the case. The blue bar is the exports by Vietnam of total of final products to the United States. And the yellow one is Vietnam's imports of intermediate products from China. So what's the story? Vietnam imports parts, components, intermediate products, process them, assemble them in Vietnam. If the value added is more than 20%, the country of the origin is Vietnam, then it exports to the United States, avoiding tariffs. And the, sea, the, the same can be seen in the entire Southeast Asia, which in 2020 has become the largest trading partner of China. It used to be the United States, now Southeast Asia, or ASEAN countries. Again, on the right-hand side, you see the exports of final products from the United States is the blue line, and the imports of intermediate products from China is the yellow line. Again, it tells the story that this country imports intermediate products and exports to the United States. The same, surprisingly, the same is true for India. India does the same pattern. As you know, the relationship between China and the India is not the most friendly, and they have border clashes from time to time. And yet, you see the same story. That is, China exports intermediate products, and then India exports final products to the United States. So the story you see here is that even though Chinese imports as a percentage of total American imports have come down, but that's just direct imports from China. Indirectly, from all these other countries, I would say Southeast Asian countries, India and Mexico, they brought in a lot of Chinese products, products meaning intermediate products, under the surface, and therefore the trade relationship between China and the United States is at this particular time all-time high. So there's, is there a decoupling? We don't see decoupling, even though there has been decoupling. There has been talk of decoupling, talk of the risking, talk of near shoring, talk of French shoring. What's happening is that there is French shoring, but exporting intermediate products to uh, all these friends of the United States, which in turn exports to the United States. So that's the reality of the relationship. 
And what's happening is that China's manufacturing is simply deepening. You know, as you can see, in about 2018, China manufacturing represents about 27% of the world's total. Now it's 31%. You know, iPhone, for example, about uh, three or four years ago, I published an article in Foreign Affairs in which I said iPhone's value added in China was only 4%. That is, if iPhone sells $1,000, the value added in China is only $40. And last year, China's value added in iPhone reached 25%. So what's the story? The story is that Chinese manufacturing is deepening. So that brings me to another subject, the subject that you were talking about just now, that is the technology war between China and the United States. You know, America has imposed restrictions on exports of semiconductors to China, especially the most advanced chips and some other products. And the question is, how effective will that be? My assessment is that in the short run, it will be highly effective. It will be highly disruptive. But in the long run, it's not going to achieve its effect. Why is that the case? Well, many years ago, I was a professor at Wharton School after I got my PhD at UC Berkeley. And my study was on the biotechnology industry, which was concentrated in San Francisco Bay Area and Route 128 in Boston area. And I was trying to figure out why biotechnology was such an American phenomenon. It was not a European phenomenon. There was not a thriving biotechnology industry in 1980s in Europe, nor was it a Japanese phenomenon even though those countries were equally wealthy, I came to the conclusion that in order for cutting-edge technology to develop in the place, you need five necessary conditions together. They make sub, uh, sufficient conditions. Number one, there has to be concentration of research institutions. And we have that in the Bay Area, San Francisco, Berkeley, Stanford, all these other universities. So there's a concentration of research institutions, concentration of the best talent in the world. America has it, especially where universities are concentrated. And then availability of capital. You know, venture capital in the 1980s was somewhat unique American phenomenon. And then deep manufacturing capabilities. America today doesn't have a strong and deep manufacturing capability as it did in 1980s, you know, in terms of leading the world. And then number fifth is a huge market where you can sell your products. And if you look at the world, America has all five conditions, not so much manufacturing capabilities, but America has access to manufacturing capabilities almost anywhere in the world. But China by itself today has the five necessary conditions, and therefore they're sufficient. And that's the reason why I believe that trade war would have only short-term effect, but not long-term effect. I'll show you some statistics collected by the Wall Street Journal. You know, these are the numbers that America and China spent on R&D. For China, it's more than 3% of GDP. For the United States, it's about 2.6%. GDP. So China spends as much in terms of GDP as the United States on R&D. And that's what I mean by having the talents, having the capital, having the manufacturing capabilities. Look at the EU, 27 countries, far behind these two countries, right? This is the number of papers in top journals published by the two countries. And it's very telling. By the way, the source is from the Wall Street Journal. They have a very good article talking about this particular phenomenon. And this is from the Financial Times by Martin Wolf, who published the article just about a few weeks ago, talking about patenting activity in China compared with other countries, uh, United States, EU countries. I think the uh, 
the purple number is the United States. Just look at it. China's patenting activity now exceeds all of the rest major countries combined. And that's the reason why short-term technology war would have an impact. But over time, there's really nothing with capital and talent you cannot reinvent. I think I'll stop here and <laughs> hand the floor back to you. So our original plan was uh, after Dr. Shan's presentation, uh, Dr. Kalish would uh, offer some comments and then we would uh, have a discussion. We've kind of turned things around a little bit. Uh, but let me first uh, ask if you have any comments on, uh, on what we just heard. Well, first, thanks for the presentation. I think it was very interesting and insightful. Um, and I agree that even though the, the U.S. and uh, European and Japanese sanctions um, may inhibit uh, China's advancement in the short term, it, it doesn't mean that it will inhibit it in the long term uh, because China does have a lot of good human capital um, and a lot of resources uh, to, to invest in these types of technologies. Uh, and it's true that um, we're seeing a lot of articles published, a lot of patents issued, uh, a lot of R&D expenditure. But the question, though, is to what extent is that efficient? Um, you can have um, a lot of um, articles published and you can have a lot of patents, but it doesn't necessarily correlate with um, innovation. And if China is so far ahead in doing these things, it should be generating uh, a higher growth rate of multi-factor productivity than it's currently doing. Uh, and productivity in China, productivity growth has actually decelerated in recent years, as has been the case here in the US too. Uh, so I'm not entirely convinced that China is prepared uh, to make the next leap uh, in the way you're suggesting. Um, and it's uh, uh, prior to your arrival, I was talking about how the current regime is more favorable toward the state sector than the private sector, that private sector investment has stalled, uh, private sector companies are not getting as much capital from overseas as foreign direct investment has slowed down. So that raises the question as to whether China can innovate its way out of the current situation uh, given the direction of policy. Let me just add one, one point, uh, if I could, to, uh, to that. Um, I think uh, I, I agree with both of, uh, both of you, actually. I think uh, in the long run, uh, both uh, this, this kind of, um, of uh, uh, technology war, if you want to call it that, will not be good for either the United States or China. Um, but it's a very complicated issue because, um, as we were saying, uh, Dr. Sean, before you came, uh, these, these most advanced semiconductors uh, are for AI and can be used in, uh, to, to simulate nuclear explosions, to, uh, to develop uh, sophisticated surveillance techniques like what we see in Xinjiang. Um, and it's that specific kind of use that the U.S. is, is trying to control. The U.S. government describes it as a, a small yard with a high fence, trying to limit a small number of, uh, of products and put a very tight restriction on those. Whether they can do it, is a different question. I mean, it's, it's a very delicate balancing act, but I think that's what, uh, what the U.S. Is, is trying to do with these, uh, with these restrictions. I think you will have to separate rhetoric from the actual practice. Uh, of course, you want to do things while on a very high moral ground at the same time. So you would use very good uh, reasons or excuses to implement certain policies. Is it really from the military? <laughs> I'm not so sure. The United States considers China to be a peer competitor. There's no question about it. And therefore, the United States policy is to suppress China's growth. Uh, whether or not it's, it can be effective is a different question. But again, I think for the short term, since trade relationship benefits both countries, not having a trade relationship or hampering a trade relationship or technological exchanges would harm both countries. For example, we talk about the trade war. So nothing has changed. The volume has reached all-time high. So why does it matter? It matters because 99% of the tariffs are borne by American consumers. 
So we have inflation in this country at this very moment. The Fed is tightening and raising interest rates to an all-time high. And they're talking about higher for longer, right? And yet we pay more for imports from China because of the tariffs. And then it turns out, if you look at the statistics, in terms of trade, they are born. That is, the high tariff costs are borne entirely by American consumers. And then if you look at technology war, for example, Qualcomm derives 65% of its revenue from China. And iPhone or Apple, 20 to 25% of its revenue from China. iPhone, I think, will do quite well in China, despite of all this tension. But I would expect Qualcomm's revenue from China to half next year because Huawei has come up with its own chips to produce 5G telephones, and therefore they don't any longer need to buy 4G chips from, uh, from Qualcomm. So I think military, <laughs> leave it aside, but I think the uh, trade war and technology war affect very substantially the living standard of the people in both countries. I fully agree with you, Ira, that uh, the Chinese policies have made the economy less efficient than they ought to be. I think the Chinese economy has much more potential than it can realize at this particular point. So this year, the economic growth rate is likely to be just about 5%. Can they grow at a higher rate? I believe so, under the right policies. Right, I agree. And I agree with you that the trade war has hurt both countries. I mean, the, the initial trade war, the tariffs, mainly hurt the U.S. and U.S. consumers and contributed to our inflation. Uh, President Trump said his goal was to reduce the trade deficit. Uh, that's not how you reduce a trade deficit, number one. Number two, Trade deficits don't matter, so it was a it was a specious argument. The Biden policy is different. It's not it, it, it kept the tariffs for political reasons, although it has allowed more exemptions from the tariffs, which is a kind of stealthy way of reducing the effective tariff rate. But the Biden policy has been to restrict exports of technology uh, and to subsidize reshoring of technology, um, whether it's for military or human rights or other issues. The problem with that is that it creates inefficiency here as well. And while the CHIPS Act, for example, may have a short-term stimulative effect on business investment in the U.S., it may in the long term reduce efficiency by uh, generating um, less efficient investment than would otherwise be the case. So I agree entirely that the conflict between the two countries uh, is damaging to both. And the goal of the two countries should be to try to find common ground to limit the damage at the very least, which I think is why your friend Janet Yellen went to Beijing not long ago, as well as uh, Anthony Blinken, uh, and spoke with their uh, counterparts. Uh, and I think the goal was in part to, uh, in recognition of the fact that uh, there is a symbiotic relationship uh, and it would be terrible to throw the baby out with the bathwater, uh, and therefore they need to find ways to limit the damage. So let's, let's stop there, and, and we have a few minutes left. Uh, maybe we can go over a few minutes, but let's see if we have questions from the, uh, from the audience. Uh, yeah. Is there a mic somewhere? Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Shen, I wanted to ask about the Huawei phone in particular. So I saw on the Chinese social media, there's a lot of enthusiasm that the chip was entirely domestically manufactured by SMIC with 5G and also satellite phone call capabilities. But from what I've seen in the American analyst perspective, they're much more skeptical about the long-term sustainability and scalability of Chinese chip making. So I wondered from your perspective what your insights are in terms of where China is in catching up to the U.S. in semiconductor design and manufacturing. I can only look at issues like this from macro point of view, almost philosophy. 
philosophically as opposed to you know what technologies that they have or each other has. Uh, I, I think that uh, in the long run, again, short term, I think a company like Huawei being sanctioned all over the world, uh, it will have major impact. It will hamper its technological progress. But in the long run, with capital, with talents, with uh, manufacturing capabilities, with the supply chain, and with a huge market in China, right? I would expect Huawei to be able to sell at least 60, 000, 60 million phones next year. Uh, with that kind of market and that kind of resources, I think over a long period of time, they should be able to uh, get to the cutting edge if they're not already there. Yeah, sorry, you had a question before. We didn't get a chance to... Uh... Hi, uh, I'm the Chief Operating Officer of a biotech company in San Diego. Uh, we're developing uh, oncology and gene therapy products, I mean, biological dr drugs. And uh, part of the reason I'm concerned about this is that our, as a startup company, our valuation uh, is dependent on the venture capital's view of our potential future market. And our business model rely on when we develop this technology and it's approved by FDA, we will uh, license that out to a lot of the uh, farmers and the biotech in the world, including China. And China market is huge. Yeah. And, and what I'm worried about is that uh, if the U.S. use the, uh, let's say, stop us from uh, out license our technology because of the uh, national security concern and uh, you know, gene therapy is one of the areas that potentially has concern, uh, you know, uh, issues with concern. Um, what if this happens and is there a potential uh, possibility that there will be a parallel pool of technology being developed in China and in the United States and they will just disregard our patents and we can we cannot do anything about it and in the long run there will be this two, two uh, parallel uh, technology ecosystem is similar to like two islands uh, separating in the, from the ocean and develop their own uh, ecosystem and, and you know it, by evolution. Uh, so, it, how likely is that, and whether that's going to be, uh, you know, in the short term or or somehow we can try to prevent that from happening? Uh, who do you talk? <laughs> Anybody? To talk to Shen. <laughs> Biotech and right. Very interesting. Your perspective. Right. I think if you look at uh, India, uh, obviously uh, India has adopted the practice that to the extent it does not negotiate a price with large pharmaceutical companies for certain patented products, they will simply make generic versions of it without regard to patents. Uh, and this happened uh, you know, even before COVID and during the COVID, uh, of course, uh, that has uh, been the case. But in China, so far, they have been very careful uh, not to do so. And uh, a more recent case was an American company was negotiating with uh, the Chinese FDA for inclusion in its procurement program, and they were not able to reach an agreement. So that company didn't sell. Uh, the product and China didn't buy that particular product and nobody was making a generic version of it either. I hope that uh, this area is different from uh, technology that can be used in weaponry or things like that. And this is human life, right? And, and therefore, I hope that uh, the uh, tensions between the two countries would not affect the uh, pharmaceutical sector which, of course, is uh, for people's livelihood. By the way, this country spends far more on healthcare than China. Uh, healthcare expenditure in the United States represents about 18% of its GDP, and China, 6% of its GDP. And American life expectancy at this moment is 78, and China is 80. So America spends three times as much more than three times because America's GDP is larger at $23 trillion compared with China, $18 trillion. 
America spends far more, more than three times as much on health care, and yet producing a lower life expectancy. And pharmaceutical companies, of course, are a big beneficiary of that huge expenditure. And you would want to sell some of the products to China to you know, get more revenue out of a patented product. Let me just add a quick point, uh, uh, getting, back to you, getting back to your concern about uh, sort of parallel uh, development in China. You can register your patents in China. In fact, you should register your patents in China. Uh, there are, you know, there have been many problems, but there is a system of, uh, of patent protection. Uh, and you can, if, if someone then infringes your patents, you can take them to court in China. So you should be doing that if you're not already doing that. Yes, there is a rule in the patent law that is something called essential patent. Then you are not allowed to withhold patents uh, or licensing patents on discriminatory basis. And if you don't uh, license uh, essential patents that you license to everybody else, but to a certain party, that certain party has the right to invent around your patent. But so far, I have not seen incidences of that happen. Okay, let's, uh, last question uh, right, right here. Yep. So, so given that we know that uh, wars in general are horrible for both sides, uh, and trade wars benefit neither at the end of the day, what's the one step that the U.S. could take to de-escalate or repair the uh, trade relationship, particularly around technology, with China? Well, I think the first step would be to lower the tariffs uh, that, that were instituted in the previous administration. That, at the very least, would reduce some of the tension, I think. I, I, I think it's unlikely the U.S. and its allies are going to uh, reduce the tension when it comes to trade and investment and technology. So I think pro probably the best thing that can be done is to reduce the tensions that affect other industries. Uh, and that's where the tariffs come in. And I would add one other thing, which is that um, in the past, we have had a whole range of dialogues between the U.S. and China at, at multiple levels, working level, all the way up to, uh, to ministerial uh, level. And those have basically all stopped. Uh, and recently, the U.S. has sent a number of, of uh, cabinet secretaries over to China. Uh, the Commerce Secretary, Raimondo, actually uh, on her visit, they agreed to start up some uh, working groups uh, together. Uh, Secretary Yellen, as was mentioned, uh, was there. Uh, Secretary Blinken was there. Yeah, Wang Yi, in fact, the, 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 the senior foreign uh, affairs, uh, the, he's not the minister, he's above the minister, actually. He's coming to the U.S. later this week, uh, which is the first uh, high-level visit from a Chinese uh, official for quite some time. And we are uh, hoping that next month, uh, President Xi and President Biden will meet on the margins of the APEC summit in San Francisco. So to me, you know, I mean, that's, you know, you can only accomplish so much, but you need to have ongoing dialogues between the two countries, uh, I think, to, in order to address some of these issues. Um, so I think we've gone slightly over time. I thank you all for your, uh, for your patience.